Thank you for uh, inviting me to speak today. I think I spoke here a couple years ago. Uh, this is, uh, I'm very honored to be asked to speak here today. I saw a gentleman at breakfast on Saturday. Some of you know him, uh, David Millen. He's an attorney here and he's dad uh, help work at uh, CSX. And he said, why are you speaking? You weren't even around in World War II. <laughs> <laughs> and that statement has bothered me for the last 48 hours. So I rolled it around and rolled it around in my head. Why am I speaking? Um, so I thought about it and I tried to, tried to decide in my own mind why I was speaking. I started doing this about 2005. At that time, my father was alive and we were asked to talk along with a person named Tom Howe. He's uh, Navy retired on LST. Woody Woodall was a person in the Army and at D-Day, he had to climb up the hill when he was getting shot at. And my father was on LST for four years. And so since that time, people have asked and I've continued to try to summarize World War II and uh, since a young kid, I've worked with my dad probably 20 years, and, uh, and then when I was back in town the last 20 or so years, I hung around with him a lot. So the topic would come up about LST, about planes, about what Evansville did in World War II. And so I became a longtime student of World War II, and my father would continue to instruct me. He instructed me about patriotism. We would go to every veteran service on Veterans Day and every Memorial Day service and I would listen to the speeches as a kid I wasn't really interested but soon it became sort of part of my consciousness and I be have become in love with our country. Uh, patriotism I think all of you have it to some degree everybody a little bit more a little bit less but uh, uh, when 9-11 hit I never saw my dad get upset with anything but he was upset at that time. Uh, something about his country he was upset with and I think all of us need to Try to follow that example and pass it on to our offspring, to our friends and our neighbors and relatives. I'm gonna have to take this off because the heat's up. <laughs> so that's why I'm up here to settle David Millen's mind that I have learned a lot of World War II because my father would continue to talk about it. And so I learned a fair amount uh, over time by osmosis. And I think you need to talk about it. You don't need to be quiet about it. You have friends, relatives, and I think one thing that I'm going to show today is Evansville in World War II. Lots of people brag about things that they really shouldn't brag about. You know, they got a little bit and they brag about this or that or whatever, but I think the opposite is true about Evansville in World War II. We don't brag enough about what we did. And we have a lot of meat to tell about, and we're not telling it. And this is part of what I'm going to say, and I want you to pass it on to other people. Uh, about a year ago, we just about lost our LST. We had it for 10 years, we about lost it. We have to support that LST. We have to support how important it is. It's the only one left in the world today that's running. And uh, I'm part of this thing called Freedom Heritage Museum, and we're gonna get a uh, P-47 here, and we're cherishing what, not just the pilots did in World War II, but what Evansville did in World War II. And by the time you're done hearing this, you hear about, um, P-47s, how we made them. You'll hear about Chrysler, how many bullets we made at Chrysler. We'll talk about that. And everything, what's happened to me is this has become very personal. My uncle was lost in World War II. And I asked everybody, my mother couldn't come. She's not feeling well, Dave. She was going to be here. She's 92, pushing on it. And she lost her brother in the Battle of the Bulge the second day. Mrs. Todd's husband was captured on the day two of the Battle of the Bulge in December 18th. But my mother's brother was in ROTC, 1939, at uh, Dayton, Ohio, where Mr. Riddell's two kids went. And so, 39 to 45, she paid attention because it was personal to her. She had a brother that was in ROTC, so she paid attention. She went to Moore High School. She said the teacher explained about World War II. But she had a personal touch because many other people I talked to, oh, yeah, it was happening, but they until somebody in their family went there they weren't necessarily it wasn't necessarily a personal touch so that's sort of why i think i'm into this okay the first thing this is uh how many people were killed in world war ii 70 million we had 2.3 billion on the planet earth so that's three percent of the population that were killed three percent lost their lives if you look at the civil war the civil war 
we lost 3% of the United States in Civil War. 600,000 out of about 30 million people at that time. Uh, so we lost a lot of people. We had devastated <coughs> families, devastated people the Civil War. And this happened to the world under some of your eyes. So if I look at that, look at the axis. That's the green and the blue is the Allied. Who won this war? The blue won the war. But look at the cost. The cost is close to more than three quarters of deaths happening in the Allied. Well, we won, but it was pretty costly when you lose lives. But that sort of hits, uh, hits home when you see something like that. Now, what was the size of these countries during that time? You're about 450 million people, about the size of the United States. And the United States now, we have close to 30, 330 million people, but at that time we were one third the size, about 120 million. Japan, about 80 million, the size of Montana. Germany, about the size of Montana, and about 70 million people. I didn't include Italy here, but that's a 150 million people fighting the rest of the world. Russia is about the same population as we are. Now this is not very visible, but it's very important. If you look, I've put the percentages up of what certain parts of the world lost their lives. The very first one is Russia. 13% of Russians lost their lives in World War II. Now I just said how bad the Civil War was, or it's 3%. That's about four to five times as many people lost their lives in Russia. It decimated that society, decimated it. In Evansville, 0.3% were killed, the same as the United States. And it bothers, you know, when I go back to this other slide, you know, this is just a, that's just a number. But when it happens to your family member, my uncle's picture was bigger than that door and it sat in my grandparents living room all their lives they never forgot that guy being gone and so even though I'm saying this to 70 million people it meant a lot to some people when they were gone a lot so you can't we can never quantify human life and you cannot put a value on it. but look at this 13% of Russians also alive. now China there was more people killed in China but it was such a big population that's only 5% of Chinese were killed Remember, Japanese fought China from 37 all the way to 45, so there's a lot of murders there, a lot of killings. Then you go to Germany. Germany's about 11% of its population. And then you go to Japan, 6%. But the other thing that's important here is, you can, if you can't see very well, but the yellow line, or this, uh, this blue line here, is the total amount of lost uh, percentage-wise. But then we have a it doesn't show up well, but this red line includes two things, civilians plus military. And when you add up military or civilians, there were more civilians lost over in China and Soviet Union than in, than in uh, many in the other places. So when the war is on your own soil, it's pretty bad. And when you look at civilians lost in the United States, it's very, very few. Look at them in England, very, very few. There was not really a lot of battles on the soil, so it helped our civilians. But I've got a quote here from a, a person that's an expert in the Third Reich. And I didn't make this slide, sorry, I think, forget things sometimes. But this is on the Third Reich uh, about what this world would be if the Third Reich uh, controlled us right now. Um, and this, he's written only three books. He's called The World Historian. His name's Evans. And it just came out last month, this book. But in it, in just, just imagine if we didn't win that war, this could be what we're living under right now. It could be how we live. He called it a toxic potent. It was just all mixed up a certain way in Germany, 1936 to 45. But it says we would ha have an authoritarian government that sounds like Hitler. We would be conformists. We'd have to conform to whatever he or whoever was in charge said. It was anti-democratic. Even though only 33% of the people vote, you wouldn't have any vote. Now only 33% vote in the United States, where we should be 70 plus, like many other countries. It'd be nationalistic. It'd be racist. And they also had a lot of genocide there. That's what you would live under. And this freedom, we don't always value as much as we should. But this is one of the biggest historians in the United States that's, that's summarized a little bit about the Third Reich. Now, I'm gonna give you some examples. 
Most people said we should have won the war, we could have never lost the war, but there could things happen. You know, when you're 100 to 1 odds, there's different things that happen. That one can sometimes happen. But look what the United States dominated in World War II. Look at what we had already, which was a major advantage. 7% of the world's population, 7%, 6%, 7 of the surface of the world, 6% of the oil, 56% of the rubber, 78% of all the motor cars, 67% of lorries, which are sort of trucks, and lead, coal, copper, and zinc. We had this. And in a long war, this is invaluable. A short war, you maybe get away with that, but in a long war, this helped us build the infrastructure that we built, that we beat Germany, Japan, and Italy with. Now, what is this as an auspicious year? When I look back at history, I think we got in the war too late, but I have a lot of people argue with me, but we got in on December 8th after the Japanese landed the bomb, or, uh, hit the, or hit Pearl Harbor. But if you look, Germany had already started their march from June through September. They conquered all of Europe just about nothing flat. They ran over Poland, they ran over France. You know, it was a matter of weeks in, most, in Aus Austria. They just ran over. There wasn't even any contest. And the problem is Hitler thought Russia was not going to be a contest. That was the problem. He didn't realize the adversary there. But look how close Hitler got within five miles of Moscow on December 5th. Now, if Hitler had his way, they'd have conquered out of Moscow by that time. If he wouldn't have made some mistakes in there, and Japan's invades the World Harbor. What do you think you'd feel like? I heard Japan just hit Pearl Harbor, and uh, Hitler just took over Moscow. That's a lot of fear. And I'm concerned about, you know, everybody says they couldn't have beat us, they couldn't have beat us. Well, if they'd had more time, if they wouldn't have had two oceans between them, they could have got us. He didn't have a good navy. So these are things that he had, but we didn't know he had. In war, there's a lot of propaganda, you don't know what he had. But Europe to the United States is about 6,500 kilometers. Germany had three different aircraft that could go 1,400 kilometers, or 14,000 kilometers. That means they get there and back, drop the bombs and come back. They had it. They just didn't have the material, the fuel, the raw materials to make this a finished product. If they'd had a finished product, I think you drop a few, if they would have had some of their scientists, they'd drop a few atom bombs in the United States, it'd have been a different war. And everybody says they couldn't do it. Well, things could have happened. Their rocket creation. So I think this is just a general thing before I get to Evansville, but loss of German scientists, uh, a lot of them left because they saw the writing on the wall. If the Germany would have had better Navy been better and more right natural resources, they could have run over us. We had 42 and 43, and that's where I'm coming with Evansville. So 42 and 43, we were part of this infrastructure build. Weather in Russia, they weren't ready for the weather in Russia. That's what happened in December. They lost that, and then they went to Stalingrad later. He didn't learn any lessons. He fought two and actually three fronts. The Eastern Front, the Western Front, he went down to Italy. He was fighting too many places. You can only stretch your army so much, and that was part of his problem. The very last thing I think is the most important, the massive industrial infrastructure we had. We woke up, and we woke up big time. If you hear or watch the movie Midway, the uh, Japanese admiral says, we have just awoken a sleeping giant. We have just awoken a sleeping giant. And we didn't know we had it in us, but we sure had it in us. And I'm so proud of Evansville. I'm so proud of the United States. I'm so proud of people that were part of this. The people that put it together, it's not just the soldiers, not the 14 million soldiers that were in uniform in World War II, but it was 10 times more than that. Usually it's seven to one ratio of people working behind those people that made that happen. What about 1930s in Evansville? We had a terrible economy. It was a depressed society. We were in a recession still across the United States. They were unemployed 15%. We just had unemployment in 2008, and it was 10%, and we were crying. We had it for one year. They had this 15% that's reported for close to a decade. We were crying like anything for one year of that. They had this forever. These are the construction things that went on. The Ohio River docks and docks and dams, uh, that didn't employ a lot of people. Henderson Bridge. Chrysler was a big deal though. In 35, Chrysler came in and that was a big deal for employment. It also showed we had a lot of work ethic around here. Crest Plaza, 36, National Guard Army, but those are not major projects. 41, we didn't have anything coordinated. We didn't have a plague depressed city. And all of a sudden, 42 to 45, we got all kinds of federal government grants. That made all the difference in the world for us. We had some smart leaders. We had some smart politicians. We had some smart congressman named Bainey 
and Dress was the, was the mayor. These guys were smart and they were aggressive and we had some aggressive businessmen that said we can do it. And if they weren't aggressive and they weren't confident, it would not have happened. So this is what happened. The, the, the war hat hits in, in uh, Hawaii. We declare war on December 8th. Within four months, we've got three major contracts. Look at the size of that employment. I add that up, it's close to 41,000. Just unbelievable. That, even one third of that would, stru would stress any infrastructure. Talked to a lady yesterday, she worked at, Cry or at, uh, at uh, Hoosier Car, and she says, no, I lived in my aunt's house, but we had five borders there. Everybody, you know, everybody couldn't live here, and gas was expensive. They couldn't come back and forth. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about Chrysler. Chrysler uh, 1442 or f it was our first contract. Until we got that federal contract, we were still uh, treading water. The head of Chrysler went to Washington, D.C., talked to all the big generals there, and the general said, we need some bullets made. And that head of Chrysler said, right in his face, we'll do it. He said, we want a five million a day, we'll do it. He says, I never made that many things in my life, but we'll do it. He didn't even quiver, he just says, we will do it. Then he pushed everyone under him, and it happened. And they moved that up to 12 million bullets a day. The three billion bullets, now how many is three billion bullets? Nobody knows what a billion is. Well, I've got a picture here, you can stack them end on end, and I've got them in the car somewhere to let you see what the size is of a 45 caliber, but I'll bring one in to let you look at it. But you stretch a 45 caliber, it's about like half the size of a little pinky. You put it in on end, it stretches three and a half, two and a half times around the globe. 25,000 miles, three times, that's a lot of bullets. That was made here within two and a half years, 42 to 44 and a half. And then with bullets, there's about 17, if you go to YouTube and watch about how to make bullets, it's not easy, it's complicated. And after they gave us that contract to make bullets, every bullet's made in brass because it expands a lot. They made them, we don't short of brass, so we had to make it out of steel. That took about three weeks of engineering to four weeks of engineering to make sure the steel was correct as the uh, container for the bullet material. Grousers, by 44, we didn't, they didn't want to make any more 45 bullets. They were about, had enough of those, so they said, let's make some metal shoes. Those are called grousers, so the shoes that help the tank from sinking in the mud, but we had to make those. And you made something the size of my pinky to a grouser that's, you know, five, 10,000 pounds. Incendiary bombs. I'll show some pictures of how we burned Japan up and they still wouldn't give up. We had a contract for $7.5 million worth of considerate bombs. This was a big plant, and they were churning and burning there. This is written, I have a copy of the book, it's on the front desk, you can look at it, but it's Bullets by the Billion, written by Christ from 1946. It summarizes what they did. This is where our catchment was. We caught people all the way as far as Harrisburg, Owensboro, Madisonville, up at Vincennes. This population came from everywhere, and that's why Evansville increased a lot in population. That's an aerial view of Chrysler. You drive by on Stringtown Road, you see Chrysler plant the windows angled. There was 500,000 square feet under roof at Chrysler. If you look at uh, the Whirlpool building where they made Republic Air, that's a million square feet. We already had 500,000 square feet under, and that's the other factory of, of Chrysler. Look at the size of that plant. Now if you go to war, you just you can't just do karate all the time and fight with your fish. You need some, need some rip pistols and rifles. And here's the rifles. But we made most of the bullets for those pistols, 96% of, and for the one rifle closest to you, we made most of the pistol uh, bullets for that. Uh, there's also, we end up having to make uh, 500,000 uh, uh, 30 caliber bullets. Those are the three guns that were made in multiple other places. We didn't make the guns here, but we made the bullets that supplied those guns. That's what it looks like, it looks simple but I'll show you in the next slide how complicated it is to make a bullet. I didn't think it was so complicated. On the bottom part of here, this is a, that has a little bit higher dose of gunpowder in it, so the, the hammer hits that and explodes all the gunpowder and shoots this uh, uh, 45 uh, bullet, or that's a 30 caliber bullet uh, a long way. This is the process of making a bullet. But we made that, and the women were there, and I talked to one woman, she said, my, the Mrs., uh, uh, her, her dad, said it was Miss Rosewater, her dad, her mother was doing that, and she said it was the most boring job ever had. I'm making that many bullets every day. Well, a lot of it was boring, but they still kept doing it. This is the first bullet they made in a, that would put in your in your uh, 45, had like shotgun pellets in it, because they thought if they got overseas, if your 
a pilot down, you'd shoot this, the fish. If you're hitting the snakes in the, in the forest, you'd be able to protect yourself a little bit better. This is called a, uh, a vacuum vacutainer, uh, a, va a vacuum surveyor. That uh, was made by an engineer. Most engineers came from Chrysler. Most of the leaders came from Chrysler, but this engineer came from Ball State High School, and he made that vacuum surveyor. So all the bullets would go through under the water, and there's a vacuum in there, and then cause bubbles if the bullets were defective. So this inspected most of the bullets, that little white machine there. This lady put them in boxes, and then they boxed 30, 30 billion bullets and sent them around the world. That's what the factory looked like for the box bullets. Those are $45. Now, when Patton or uh, MacArthur in the West, out in the Philippines and things, these are cans. And when we had, when we made three billion bullets, and he said, I don't want them in the boxes, I want them in the cans. So they had to repack and get rid of the boxes for one and a half billion bullets and send, put them in cans. So the cans were airtight, so they wouldn't be affected by the sand. This is what bullets, you lead them, put them in by end. This is how many bullets would be made. It's really not perceivable. If one of you could make 100 bullets a day, no, 100 bullets a minute. A minute. You couldn't do it, but if you could, it'd take you 212 years to make that many bullets. 100 bullets a minute, 212 years. That's how many bullets we made here. Mm. This is the grouse on the bottom. A tank's about 70,000 pounds. Your car is, you know, four or 5,000 pounds. So the tank's, you know, more than 10 times your side, the, the weight of your car. This is a incendiary bomb. We burned Japan, and we use that as trying to uh, tell them to quit. This has been center bonds made. This is dropping from up in the air, up in uh, over Japan. This is Tokyo. Most of Tokyo was burned. And this was, you're talking May, May March of, two, of 1945. March of 1945, then they went and burned two other cities, one where they made their zero planes. Then they still wouldn't give up. This is March. And they burned a whole city, wouldn't give up. Now, there were a lot of lives lost in Tokyo because people didn't believe we were going to burn them. They lost about 100,000 lives of this drop into the air, of these uh, incendiary bombs. The other two cities, there's only seven, 8,000 lives lost because they ran out when they knew we were coming. But this is Tokyo, and this is a diagram. It just burned us in, and they didn't care. They are still coming. That flag, the bottom part of the flag, that's American flag at the top, but the other one is an E award. 1% of factories in the United States got E awards in World War II. We had about five or six E awards in Evans. Absolutely amazing. That means expert, means great quality assurance, everything quality. We had E awards that were unbelievable here. I mean, one percent of factories get an E award, and we had four, or five factories get an E award. That's a that's a big bragging rights. Now I'm moving from Chrysler to the LST, and then I'll go to Republic Air, and then I'll let you have a break. We're at <laughs> twelve forty thirty-five. Uh, uh, Miss uh, Mary Lou said, when you start fidgeting, they're bored. So when I see you fidget a lot, I'm gonna know that I gotta stop. So um, when I see you moving around, I'm gonna start quitting. Okay. My wife says I talk too loud, anywhere too too fast, so I'm gonna try to slow it down. Uh, okay, LST. One month later, we get a contract for LST. Approved for construction. Okay, now the 45 acres next to me, John, so I'll show you pictures. 19,000 to peak over time up to 70,000 because there was coming and going of a lot of people. A person that worked, at, worked as a waitress could make a dollar an hour, so on a, in our day, eight to ten dollars, but at, at LSD plant, look how much she could make, thirty-seven dollars. You know, she she you know, tripled her tripled her wage at the LSD plant. Now you can do the calculation, but she made a lot more money, so they ran away from waitressing and went to the LSD plant. This was a costly plant. These are the different plants in the United States. Okay, we were called a cornfield plant. We made more LSTs than any one factory in the United States. You look, there were five cornfield plants. That's in the center of the country there. The cornfield was because they thought our, our shores were going to be invaded and we wouldn't, those ones on the shore would not be effective anymore. So they made, more than half of them were made in the cornfield plants. And we made 167 in our LST plant, made more than they were in the United States. And we made them well. Never made a ship before, but we learned how. Never made a bullet before, but we learned how. Never worked on a grouse before, but we learned how. That's called American ingenuity and improvisation. That's how you win wars, is you impro improvise and you make it work. The Ohio River was lucky. You couldn't make any bigger ships here because it would get stuck in the river. And when they talked to Hitler, or they talked to some of Hitler's, or saw some of Hitler's on the bomb list, we were supposed to be 17th on the bomb list. Why? Because if they blow up the dam at Newburgh, it would make our LSTs ineffective because we couldn't get them down the river 
because the, 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 the uh, had to be deep enough pool stage. Same from Jeffersonville up in New Albany. So that's why we're on the bottom list, plus because we're making all the bullets here. This is what, uh, you see Me Johnson there and you see St. Boniface's steeples there. That's the yellow, that's the riverfront there, the 25 or 45, 25, 45 acres, I think 45 acres there. They tore a lot of shanties down, trees, and then this is what it looks like. That's what it looked like after they put the railroad tracks uh, look like railroad tracks to carry the big ships after they were made. That's what it looks like 1944, 1990. Look at the difference. You see me Johnson in the background. You don't see Br 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 Bristol Myers or the uh, St. Boniface, but this is the difference. And that was a shaking and making place. Burned down, I think, 46 or 45, but there wasn't a ton of stuff to burn down. This is what the ships look like. If you look at Bossy Field, Enlo Field, and these other fields or football fields, that, that ship encompasses about a third of the football field. It's 50 feet wide, football field is 150 feet wide. So it's, you put three of those ships in a football field. They're about 100 yards long, 300 feet long. So after they pushed them out in the water, they were done with the outside part, but the inside part, these are called ways up and down there, and those are the caissons holding. There's about 10 of them in line there. And what they do is then they outfit, they put the radios on, do other things, because that was inefficient to do while they make the big ship. So this is the back of the ship. It's a tremendous innovation. Uh, my dad would give me a lecture on it mm, once a week, once a month. I know more about the LSD because he kept telling me about it. Only ship that has a bigger anchor on the front than, or excuse me, a bigger anchor on the back than the front. But why uh, the front's the uh, bow and the back's the stern? It's because it would hold it steady. If you put a canoe or any type of ship against a, uh, a ocean wave and you put it in the land, what would happen is the waves would shove it to the side. So the big anchor on the back would stabilize it, also help it get back off the land. This would give us ability to land tanks and great big jeeps other things on land we can't beat the couldn't beat hitler with just a little cop cap, cap gun you'd need a little bit something bigger and this was made this happen this was an invention for world war ii that's and they had the submariner help build it where they have ballast that raised in lower different parts of that ship that's the unique part of it the front part of it the bottom part could hold 15 sherman tanks and they roll right out the front of that ship on land that means you don't have to build a bridge. You don't have to have a, a port. You can land on any beach that you can land this ship on. So that's a tremendous invention. Over about 1,100 made in World War II, and some people say that plus the Higgins boat won the war. Now the Higgins boat would hang from, we've got two of them in town here. The Higgins boat would hang from this little joist here on the end of the ship right here. There's a Higgins boat, and they made New Orleans. They'd hold 36, 36 men or women, and they would land on the on the shore, and they said that won World War II because it could get to get the men on the land easily. Uh, the front of the ship uh, may be just a may just be a foot or two in the water, empty in the back, about seven or eight feet in the water. Right here is full; it's a little bit heavier, but that would allow the front to land on the beach and then get back off the beach, uh, land at high tide, uh, uh, unload, or land, and then uh, and then low tide. Uh, high tide would uh, come back off the off the beach. This is christening. James Morrison's a friend of my wife's. Her daughter is, and this is a christening. They have that. Mm -hmm. I always have that champagne, that wine, that wine, that champagne get all over you. Well, it's actually it, it'll get over you, but the glass is in a bag, and so the bag, the, the bottle, uh, is contained in some bag there. And whoever did that, that's only 167 now, so that's pretty. You got the roses, and sort of a big deal. And that's when they push the ship in. And the ship took about half an hour to go in. They didn't let it just run in quickly. It took a long time for it to, to go down that, that, that ways there. It was a slow process. Then after that, then they're sitting over here to get processed over here and up and down here. And that's what uh, these men here were. It's called, uh, my dad got to do that one day where they raise a broom and that's called the brooming. So they really had a christening and then a, a brooming. Uh, yes, sir. They called it the clean sweep. Clean sweep. Okay, the clean sweep when it had all the radios and all the other stuff on, all the inside was fixed. They called clean sweep. So they raised that broom up, and when the broom was raised, uh, that was called the clean sweep. Thank you. This is the first deal late, uh, uh, June of 42, christened about three months later. Uh, and you look at how many we made here 167 out of uh, close to 1,100 United States, 15%, more than any other place in the United States, of the cornfields. Uh, close to 25% just of cornfield wounds. Of all ships made in World War II, we're at about 1.5%. Um, and then in 45, we stopped producing because we won the war. Um, 
and the reason for it is less risky than, than other places. Okay, these are the battles we use the LST in, all these different battles. The first one, the Husky, we're going to have a reenactment and on the last slide. And I'll give you a handout. Everything I've given you here, I'm going to hand it out to you so you don't have to write it all down. I don't see you all writing a whole lot, but I'll <laughs> have a handout for you. Um, but uh, the Husky was our first battle, and it was in, in Sicily. And this year, on June 27th, we're going to have a reenactment. Last year, we had a reenactment where it was Normandy we invaded. But this year, we're going to have two Higgins Bowl, the LST, and we're going to have 47, C-47s dropping paratroopers out of the air, and we're going to reenact, we've got 50 reenactors. June 27th, June 27th of this year, of, of when that's going to happen, and I'd like you to come down there, I'll have an invite for you, it's by invitation only, I'll get you top of the old National Bank building. World War II veterans have first priority, and then everybody else has second priority. Uh, there are $10 tickets, but I'll give them to you free, but we have enough room for 178 people. That's it. Then you got to turn everybody else away. But it's top of the night. Bank. You'll watch the reenactment starts at 12 at 11:30. Then we'll have a lecture of some people talking about Rosie Riveters and some other things. Then later at one o'clock, these things called the Blue Angels. I don't know if you've heard of them, but they're going to fly over. So you're going to have the best seats in the city. So you have to talk to my wife. She'll be in charge of uh, getting reservations. Uh, she loves these extra jobs. <laughs> Before you leave today, I have another handout on your table. It has lists of your name, your address, your email, your phone number. And if you would like, if you know anybody that has any material from 1938 to 1948, we're collecting any material that was made in World War II, and we'll put it in the Freedom Heritage Museum. The Freedom Heritage Museum, we just got the old Bristol Myers hangar. We'll be starting there as our temporary home, and our new home will be next to Hampton Inn that's on Highway 41, right next to Tri-State Arrow. And that will be where we will house when we find that uh, P-47 in the near future. We haven't found it yet. So these are the other places the LST battle. Now I have most of the battles I see, I think somebody back there says I'm Mission Hiroshima, but these are the battles that happened. And you, Husky was a very difficult battle. It was not an easy landing. Everybody sees the pictures of, of Normandy. Well, there was a big sandy beach there. Many of these other beaches weren't sandy and weren't friendly beaches. Um, many of them were very difficult. When you get coral reefs, my dad was in you know, the Battle of Okinawa, and his ship was stuck on a coral reef for 24 hours. You don't think that was scary with the zeros running around? And he stuck because you get caught in low tide, and he was stuck. They, they didn't have good maps. And in Okinawa, I was stationed there, ironically, about 40 years later, and I didn't pay enough attention to this, but I would have to walk out in waste water before I could get over into deep water. So LSTs couldn't even, he couldn't even get in there without dynamite and part of the, uh, part of the, uh, uh, the island to get larger ships in. And when you look at pictures of Okinawa, those, those ships are not on the beach. They're out in the deep water and smaller things that bring them. That war was a long war over there. This is what it typically looks like when you see pictures. That's a 325, that's from Evansville, and that's in Normandy. It made many passes, I don't have the exact number, back and forth. And this is all the logistics. Look at all that heavy equipment that's going on the LSTs. This is a smaller ship. Look at the men, look at those Jeeps that are stuck in the water, or those mechan mechanical machines in the water that are too deep. They're not running anymore. Look at those men, how deep the water is. This is the closest that ship can get to the, to the beach. So that's what we, you don't want. And some of those men, they have all their weight up on the top and they turn upside down, they can drown. It's a very difficult to handle the beach. The little blimps there are trying to prevent the, the, uh, the Messerschmitts or the, uh, the uh, warplanes from uh, trying to dive bomb. They can't get close enough because they get caught in those wires. This is the Philippines. The Philippines was a pretty good landing base for the LSTs. This is an LST. My dad was at sea for close to 90 days. That's longer than anybody uh, even Magellan. Magellan was sort of around the world, but that's one of the longest uh, times that a whole fleet was at sea. That was from in March all the way to in June when we beat Okinawa. Think of the logistics. That ship needs food, that ship needs oil, that ship needs gas on a regular basis. And that's just one. And there was a large fleet. Look at that mean ocean. You wait to get out in the ocean in bad weather. It is not fun. That's a tremendous feat, the supply land to beat Okinawa and beat every other island that we had over there. Now the last part of this talk is going to be about P-47s. Now this is, we already have the LSD, we need to support it more. We haven't figured out how to support Chrysler and support a museum for them, but this is a P-47. 
Now, I didn't know much about it, but I'm actually falling a little bit in love with it. Not as much as my better half over there, but I'm <laughs> falling in love with this a, a little bit. She's still very safe. Okay. Anyway, this LSD is a beautiful picture. It's a large machine, uh, and I'll show you some pictures of it. But anyway, what I want you to concentrate on, there's three machine guns here. They're Browning Automatics. My name's Browning, but the Browning Automatic, I did not invent that machine, but they're 50 millimeter bullets. So the bullet I showed you, it's about the end of the size of my thumb. That's about 20, it's about, it's 13 millimeters, okay? Uh, there's difference between millimeters and calibers. Excuse me, this is a 50 caliber gun. That's a 50 caliber gun. The bullet comes out about the end of my thumb. That's about 13 millimeters. Lots of other guns in the Japanese planes and the European planes had a little larger guns. They had some of them had 20 millimeters, so it was a double the size of the bullet. They had smaller ones too, but we had four on this side and four on the other. And whenever the pilot pulled that gun, they had about between 250 and 400 bullets for each one of these guns. And the bullets weighed about a half, a quarter, third of a pound each, so that's a lot of weight on this plane. Because you have all these bullets round and around in this wing here and going to go out. He pushes that bullet, that gun, 23 seconds is all the bullets he has in there. 23 seconds to shoot all those bullets, and they're gone. So you don't want to shoot all everything faster, you're a defenseless airplane. And there's a camera, not on this side, but on the other side. So every time you push that button, there was a camera. So they documented who they hot, hit and who they didn't. So they, uh, we talk about aces, we got a bunch of aces was more than five kills uh, per year, or per, uh, per pilot. And if you look at some of the German pilots, they had 250, 300 kills, but they were over in Russia where they were very defenseless and they would count all those as kills. This contract, uh, the last one of the three, 322-42, and they were worrying about us not being able to do this because we had the LST contract. The LST contract was in a debate. Paducah was going to get Paducah's water was too deep at the port, and they didn't have enough land. We made 6,242 planes, and we never made a plane in our life. And there's close to 30,000 employees that helped make these planes. The support, the support for this is just unbelievable. I mean, making a plane, I can't even make a little toy and make it a plane. Broke ground 4742. Uh, started making them in June, and they had a, what you call a, uh, a modification center, and that was a completed building, and they made four of those. They had all the stuff come from Farmingdale, New York, and four planes there before we even mass produced them. First plane was completed individually as opposed to mass producing. Half the people were women, they were Rosie Riveters, and I had invited one today, but she wouldn't. She couldn't come. But Rosie Riveters, a tremendously difficult job holding that gun up all day, and it's a heavy gun. Somebody on the back is called the buck that holds, a, hold it, holds them in place. About half of the Thunderbolts were built here. We built 6,000, Farmingdale made about 8,000, so we're close to half of them. Cervell made all the wings, and they uh, put the wings on trains and sent them back to uh, Farmingdale, New York. So Cervell made the wings, which is, you know, you add uh, you know, 14,000 planes, that's about 20,000 wings, but then we made extras because there were things that were destroyed in the war, and it was easier to send a new one there than <coughs> trying to fix the old one. This is the stat statistics. You may not be able to read it, but it essentially says over here, we, uh, we actually passed up Farmingdale production back in 45. In 44, we caught up with them. And they were they were the plant that were they were there for many many years before the war. This is the total amount. And at the end of the war, 1945, there was an order for 5,000 new P-47s, and that's what was going to send, be sent to Japan. If they would not have given up, we had already had the order, and that was canceled. So you made 15,000 there, and we we're going to make 5,000 more. There's another plant called Curtis White in Buffalo, New York. They'd already been making plants planes for years and they couldn't do the job very well. None of their planes went out of the country. They made a tour of 354, and they stayed in the country and used for uh, 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 pilot ferries and other people just to learn how in training. But look at the accomplishment of Evansville, Indiana in 1942 to 45. Never played a plane in their life, and look what they did. That's what the plane looks like. It was so versatile. I can't believe it. A tremendously versatile plane. This is an extra gas tank on the bottom because it would sometimes not have enough gas to go a long distance. You know, in a range of a thousand miles, when you had extra tank a little bit more. 
These are five inch rockets, three on each side. They were used a fair amount, but not as effective as even the guns. You still have the guns there and the weight. And sometimes instead of putting that there, we, uh, the gas tank, we'd put a bomb there. Sometimes we'd put a bomb on either side. It could hold up to 2,500 pounds of bombs, more than all the other fighter pilots that were out, fighter planes. This engine, this is an oval-shaped intake, the only one of all the engines. That's the symbol of our museum, is an oval-shaped uh, Freedom Heritage Museum. And this engine's gigantic. It's 2,800 uh, cc's. It was a circle of engines. I'll show you a circle of pistons, nine, and then another nine, so 18 pistons. Double to triple the size of most other planes that were called fighter planes. This was a fighter plane and a bomber plane. It did a lot of bombing and a lot of destroying of trucks, trains, and bridges, which helped slow Hitler down and also over in the Japanese uh, setting. This is the different planes. This is in your handout, but really, when you look at it, this is a Spitfire. That was a popular one in, in England, and they made 20,000 of those. That was a lot lighter, a little bit more nimble than this than our plane. Our plane was so big, ours was faster, but it was not as nimble. The Zero, uh, they made 10,000 of those, Mitsubishi plant. Their weight was 5,300 pounds. The Spitfire was 6,700. Ours was 1,700 pounds loaded, close to three times the weight of these other planes. So it was a, they call it the Jug. They thought, man, how can this thing be a fighter plane? And then the Messerschmitt, which was in Maine, they made 33,000 of those in Germany. They used a lot of prison labor from Austria and some other places. Maximum speed, the P-47 was the fastest at 443, but couldn't turn quite as fast. The other one's a little slower. The range, the main thing is the range of zero could go 2,000 miles. The P-47 is in the range of 800, depending on if you're ferrying or if you're in combat. Spitfire, not very far, 900 miles, and the Messerschmitt meant very short, 521 miles. The guns are pretty similar, but we had, you know, eight of those guns. The other ones, a lot of times, just had four guns, but they sometimes had bigger guns. Uh, the bombs, a big difference. We could hold 2,500 pounds of bombs, and the other ones a lot less because they were not as big a plane. But well, we were very good when we went up high and would come down. Our velocity was unbelievable. Uh, velocity got up over 500 miles an hour. This plane, set one of the uh, one of these planes set the speed record of the record says about 503 miles an hour that was 1945 or so that record for a single prop engine that record was not beat till 1990 now there's debate about that but think of that that's how fast the thing was so when it came down it, its structure had to be put together pretty well and a lot of them made here this is found over in Europe and it's uh, we're trying to it's been resurrected and rebuilt. It's probably the nicest one. It was made in Evansville, and we're trying to get it for Evansville. This little dome on here is a bubble dome. They changed a the bubble dome about 1943, late 43. This is made at Hoosier Cardinal, and very good bubble. And this is all bulletproof in the front. Uh, and before that, it was called a bird cage. I'll show you what it looks like. But this was easier for the pilots. They could see behind them better, and they could get out of their seat a lot faster. That's a zero, a lot lighter plane. If I look at the dimension on this, this is. Uh, close to the same width, but it's a lot shorter plane. It's only 29 feet long, where the, our plane was 39 feet, so it's you know 10 feet shorter. But this baby was a heck of a plane, a heck of an invention by by the Japanese. And if you read about it, I think it was, their the copyright was stolen from an American named Falk that made a bunch of planes, and he's looked that plane over and says there's three or four of my big parts that are that they just already took his copyright or patent from the mid 19 uh, mid 1930s. This is a P-51. This is a this is a tremendous plane, and they've used that from 1943 all the way to 1980. They didn't make any more Thunderbird Thunderbolts uh, after the war. They kept making this. This was the sort of cat's meow. This thing was faster, a little more nimble. But the problem with this plane, it's water cooled. So one bullet hits that, and that plane's down. The P-47 was was air cooled. That means it could take bullets. It come back with two pistons gone. It still get back there. The P-47 was rugged. So over in Europe, they used it for lower flying things, hitting trains, hitting um, lots of trucks, hitting bridges, things like that. With this, once one little 22 hit it, it was gone. If it because it's air uh, water cooled, boom, that plane was out of it. But it's a little faster, and uh, if you're a pilot, you less chance of coming home in that. And the Thunderbolt, you'd have better chance of coming home. So we broke ground. This is Mayor Dress. He was a tall guy, but this is a picture by Carl K. Connect, and Carl K. Connect was a uh, person that uh, 
showed us a lot of things of history and he was a very worldly person. This is beginning of Whirlpool right here. This is the plant starting at the south end working to the north. They're constructing. Remember, they constructed that in a very short period of time. And this is their business building here. This is a concrete building. Look at this. It's shaped just like a plane if you look at it from a helicopter. You've probably driven by that a million times, didn't know it's shaped like a plane. You can't tell from the front, but if you look at it from a helicopter, the front part's the wings and here's the tail. And that's uh, the front of Whirlpool. And just recently they had a fire down in this area and I was worried when it happened, just like the LSD plant did. We got that burnt in 46 or 47 here. I was worried about this being burnt, but it ended up not a bad fire. This is what it looked like when they first first started. There is another helicopter view uh, when you look at spring of 42, and this is what it looks like a little bit later in the year. Um, this plane is a very complicated plane, but we put it all together. You know, that's a that's a cockpit. Cockpit's a lot bigger than a lot of these other fighter planes. A lot of room. We put a big purse in there. This was a Cadillac in regards to room. Those are the guns I showed you, 50 uh, caliber. Look at the size of the wheel. Look at the size of that plane. It's a big plane with the tire that uh, retracts up. These are the women sewing the tire, uh, the area that, where the tire keep it weatherproofed, where the tire uh, became part of the plane wing. There's the women over at uh, Cervelle. Cervelle made, uh, you know, 30,000 wings. That's the tail fin. The lady was supposed to be here today, Mrs. Juan Seeler, but that's called the aileron. aileron. And that's the part that makes the plane turn left or right. Pretty important part. Who's your car don't build all of those? And that's one of the very, you can't turn in the plane, it's a problem. That's a 247 gallon gas tank, goes right about a little ahead of the pilot. With lots of gas, I mean 247 gallons, your car, you know, 10, 20 gallons, it's 10 times. Everything's about 10 times more in your car. That's a plan, look at, that's a Farmingdale plant, that's in New York, but over here I'm just, they had all those wings in line that came from Evansville. Those wings were made in Evansville, sent by train here, packed in boxes and sent in train by train. It's the top of the plane. There's Rosie Riveters, and these are the women making those those guns. We do have one in our collection. One gun. That thing's heavier than anything. I mean, you can't believe. It. See those women? That's one gun. That's one. We have eight of those guns on the wings. Look at the size of those babies. And this is where they practice shooting. They said that's still there. Whirlpool. I can't find it anywhere. But that's. They build a mound there, and that's just practicing the, uh, the the shooting to make sure the guns are working right. This is all how many ca uh, uh, containers are being extracted after the shells. guns are shot. The shells, thank you. That's the word shells. <laughs> and that's the front view. This is a construction of that that uh, place where they the gun butt, and it was, uh, uh, you know had a lot of wood in it, a lot of sand, to protect the bullets from hitting anybody else out by Sunset Cemetery. This is the. Uh, uh, this is the factory, all the lines going. Look at the size of that engine, just gigantic. There's a propeller. They tried it with three propellers and then they had moved to four. Lots of good lift with four. There's a view, and these are the things that happened. Once they, the plane was okay, you put it out of here and you do a compass check on it. It had to get its compass check, and there was no metal around there. Then it would move from there. Uh, after it did its compass check, come up and run up down here, close to 50 miles an hour, and they check, make sure they primed the brakes. When you get new brakes in your car, you're supposed to run around and prime them a little bit. So they would check the brakes there, uh, and then the test pilots would uh, take off after those things. This is where they would check the bullets, and this is where I just showed you where they shot the bullets. They'd sit there, and they'd shoot bullets, make sure the guns were working all right. This is where all the pilots hang out. This is, I drove by war the other day. I don't see that, but I'm sure it's there somewhere. It's a little room. That's where all the test pilots uh, hung around. This is how many Planes. In 1944, we had a backlog of these planes. We had we had 250 that hadn't taken off by the ferries, and they went to. Um, uh, if you took those 204, you could stretch them from Whirlpool all the way to the Lloyd Highway. That's how many we had here. Mm -hmm. Then they backlog and they'd send them up north to uh, uh, north of here, about 25 miles. And then they would do other things with them. Then they go off to war. Uh, this is over in Saipan, big part of. Of, of our military. Look at the logistics when we would take them over west or take them overseas. You had to have a crane pull them off. These planes, big bombers, they bombers they would uh, take and uh, fly them from island to island, but these, they put them on a carrier. We had 29 real carriers and about 100 carriers that would be transport carriers, but the 29 real carriers were the ones that would uh, take off the planes. They would take off of the off of the carrier there, and this was going to Saipan. And uh, look at the size of that's a bomb being placed on the bottom of one. There's the, uh, the uh, uh, what are those things called, uh, missile, missile areas. And this is, this is a test one that was made here, and it's just a fantastic uh, plane, unbelievable. That was with a uh, whole more gasoline for, for out west to going to Japan. We had to a little bit more distance. 
Um, that was a, it was a YouTube, if you want to grab a YouTube, so you can see uh, the roof line and Thunderbirds didn't do that day and the LST story. And these are the events we've got going on. I told you about them earlier, the reenactment. We've got a, a little bit of hangar thing for the families. I told you, tell you exactly where that's on 626, on 627 on top of National Bank. Talked my wife for a ticket and uh, they got a bunch of videos on and this is a patriotic, uh, a patriotic time. I have a little bit of show and tell on two other things here. If we can turn the lights on, uh, then I'll just show you something we've got here. This is a book by Harold Marty. He's going to give a talk, I think, tomorrow night at Willard Library. This guy has been in every library, USI Library, Library of uh, the, the Museum Library, uh, University of Evansville Library. He sits in his libraries and he takes photographs of everything that's there, all old pictures, USI Library, and he documents it well, and then he tells a story about it. It's, it's all about our P-47s and about our LSTs. This is another gentleman. I went to his house last night, and he is drawing a picture. His name is... Um, Ken Wilson, this is a picture of him, and he was supposed to come today, but he got wife got sick and he could come. This guy's only spent 45 years uh, working with the with the P-47, so 45 years, 45 years. This is his book, supposed to come out in December of this year. Talks all about P-47. He interviewed 200 different people that worked at the P-47 factory, and he has records on every one that we have made here in Evansville. This plane, was sent from here to Seymour, and it's in the Smithsonian right now. It's never been in civilian hands. In the Smithsonian, it's in perfect shape since it's Smithsonian. We'd love to have that one here for our museum, but I think it's a little hard to get. But this is uh, Ken Wilson, and that's the official hat. You got the hat. It says Republic Aviation, uh, Indiana Division of Republic Aviation, and he has drawn this picture. He's all self-taught individual, self-taught. He made a picture like this, a diagram, on a special type of paper. It's like silk with a, 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 a very special type of pen. And this picture is in the bottom of Willard Library. It's about the size of, it's four feet by two feet. It's a nice uh, building there. There are cost of $100, that's without framing. And all the, don't, all the uh, funds will go to, to uh, Willard Library. It's no, no money in his pocket. This is a reenactment that's going to be on the Ohio River on June 27th, love to have you there. And the last book is Bullets by the Millions. This was written by Chrysler. There not many copies left, but some of the slides were from there and tell you how Chrysler did what they did in a short period of time. Well, I'm sorry I went over, but thank you for your time. Appreciate that. <laughs> any questions? Do you have any questions? Do I have any questions at all? Yes, ma'am. I'm a little confused about the different museums that are being built in the United States, but there's one in Louisiana and it sounds like it's the World War II Museum in the United States. Um, how many different states are going to have a World War II Museum? Okay, I'll repeat the question. She says, how many different states in the, world, or in the United States are going to have World War II Museums? She's she been to the one in New Orleans, which I think is the premier museum in the, in the world right now. Absolutely fantastic. It does both Europe and the, and the Japanese uh, front. Uh, we have studied this at length. We've only been working on this for three years, and probably we've gone another 20, but from what I can find, air museums of not just World War II, but other aircraft in Vietnam and other eras, uh, there's about 243 active in the United States right now. That would put about five per state if you had divided it up. And a lot of them, you could just have a building like this or not much, and some of them are much more extensive. Uh, the biggest... Uh, Working Aircraft Museum is in uh, Midland, Texas, and I have not visited there yet. I've looked at their website, but they're going to move it from there to Dallas. It has flying airplanes that are just in super condition. There's one in Everett, Washington, and a guy that's ha half of Microsoft. I've called him trying to get that plane here because he's got one P-47. That's in Everett, Washington, and it's got a bunch of World War II planes. But the cost and upkeep of keeping up with World War II planes is not easy. Uh, but uh, your question is why should we create all these museums uh, and are we duplicating efforts and that's a that's a, a major question keeping a museum going is not easy uh, you look at the downtown museum we've got the african-american museum we've got downtown museum we've got indiana museum up in Vincennes. it's a very good museum that's a judge uh, judge has been working on that for about since he's age five he's 70 now and it's a tremendously good museum he's been getting stuff in and so 
I, I, that is a very difficult question. I would say I want, if I look at Evansville 200 years from now, the most historic thing for Evansville was the three things I've shown you. And I may be wrong in the 21st century, but in the 20th century, this was a amazing feat by this community. And I can go to all the communities. I can go to, we went to Asheville, North Carolina, they got the Biltmore House, and they got other things at other places. We've got bragging rights of what we did. And if we don't tell our kids of what this civilization did, and I don't pass it on to other people, and if we just ignore it, that's fine. I think we can do that. But I think it's up to us as a community to support these things that were part of of, of World War II. Now, costs of these things are cheap, and I don't know the right thing, and, and those answers are very difficult answers, but uh, uh, I'm interested in it because I think it helps with the education of the next several generations, and that's really why I'm into it, and um, and you can say, well, let's do it all down in New Orleans, let's do it all somewhere else, we could do that. There's Wright-Patterson, there's a, and there's another one over in New York or in Pensacola, big Air Force museums. But I think we want something tangible, something that kids who put simulators in there where kids learn how to fly, they get the feeling of flying. You have, there's simulators that reenact P-47s. We tell them really how P-47s work. Some of them want engineering minds, some of them have an art mind, some have other things. And that's long-winded answer to say, you got a good question and I don't know the answer to it. <laughs> Anybody else? I've been to that one at Midland, and it, it, it's really great, and they have an enactment every year. She said Midland has a great museum. It is, it is the number, it's called, I'm a member of that, it's a community uh, Air Force, or community of Air Force, what it's called. It costs a little bit to become a member, but it's superb. And what she's saying, reenactment, but also there's what's called uh, living history, where I dress up my wife and I were just in Mobile and there was living history of the Civil War. A guy dressed like a, a Civil War, uh, were in a, at a nice old, there was some hotel there, and he shot the cannon and he talked all about the Battle of Mobile. That's living history. Most of these museums are moving to living history where we have somebody get up in a World War II outfit and then talk and the kids will pay attention. The people will pay attention. They don't go too long, not like I did today, but they go long enough that they get the point across, and you're in the uniform, you have the background. Uh, I think education, if you look at societies, there's five things in societies that make us strong. We are a superpower in the United States, a superpower, because we have all five things. Number one is a strong defense. Number two is strong business. Number three, some spirituality, depending on what it may be. Education and healthcare. This is education, this is the government, and this is uh, military. This is all three things. But all of them work together. And if you don't keep a strong side, there's no other superpower in the world. China will be when they get a defense, and Russia would have been if they'd had a military, if they'd had a uh, had a business, but they had everything else. We are a superpower. England was at one time, but uh, we have to keep that superpower because I think we have better ethics than anywhere in the world. Maybe I'm biased, but I think we do have better ethics, and so we have to keep all those balance, and that's part of the educational balance. Anybody else? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Always enjoy. <laughs> I think we're just.